Hello and a very warm welcome and welcome back to World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinars. It's, I think our last one was in something like May 2021 and here we are at the end of November 2022. Don't quite know where that time went. If you've been uh, with us before, you've kindly joined us by Zoom. We're just going to wait for our Facebook Live uh, followers to join us and we've now a very warm welcome to our Facebook live followers for this, the first Wednesday webinar for World Health Welfare on, um, for 2022. And you're, you're a very warm welcome. So you can support World Health Welfare in many different ways and indeed sort of help equine welfare by encouraging your friends to watch our webinars, all our previous webinars, all the way back from June 2020 are on our YouTube channel. So you can register for each of our webinars and we'll be running them every fortnight um, over the winter period. Um, and you can register by Zoom. It's the best way to join us, but you can join us on Facebook Live and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we put links to those in the chat shortly. But tonight we're going to be talking about pain and related behaviour and hopefully busting a few myths in the process. So today's title is Myth Busting. Is my horse being a pain or in pain? Um, this in, uh, is a topic that is uh, thanks in part to our presenter tonight is really gaining significant traction within the uh, horse owning world, both within the veterinary world and with us as horse owners as well. So I'm delighted to welcome back to our Wednesday webinars, Sue, Sue Dyson, who's going to lead us on a presentation for about 30 minutes. And then we're going to be joining, joined by Rosa Vervais from Riddle College, who's going to be um, joining us for a structured few questions. And then the floor is very much over to you. So we'd really welcome your questions. And if you're joining us on Zoom, then please use the Zoom, uh, the Q&A function. By all means, use the chat function to uh, chat amongst yourself. But if you've got a question, use it on the uh, Q&A tab. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, then please put them in on the comment section and we'll sh shift them across. And of course, if you enjoy tonight's discussion, which I know you will, then please tell your family and friends and there will be a recording of tonight's webinar, as well as all of our webinars up on our YouTube channel afterwards. And as I say, we are running our webinars through the winter. So if you've got ideas for what we could do for future webinars, then please do email us on education at worldhorsewelfare. Dot org. We are nearly done with the instructions. In two weeks' time, we're not quite sure. It might be a first Wednesday webinar that's not on a Wednesday, because if you cross your fingers and your legs and everything else and your English, England might be playing in the World Cup in two weeks' time. Probably not, but they might be. So we might need to shift our next webinar, which is going to be on balancing the needs of the horse with the pressure of competition. And we're going to be joined uh, Dake permitting uh, by uh, Rolex Grand Slam winner Pippa Funnel and rising star Elsa Waits. And we'll put, you can register for that now and we'll confirm the um, the day once the football has sorted itself out. So now, if you know us previously, you know we'd we love to get you involved early doors. So um, normally I can do this if I go to that and share. Um, and then uh, if I go to from the beginning, Really? So there, there we are. That's the, the, the webinar you're in. And I, we want to ask you a poll. Do you feel confident that you could identify whether a horse was in pain or not? Now, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, put your answers in the comments, but we won't be able to include that in the poll. So next time, do sign up to, 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 to the, the Zoom function. You'll be able to get involved in the poll. But if you're on Zoom now, then you should have four options. Remember, there's no right or wrong answer. We just want to get a feel for um, what's out there. So do you feel confident? Yes, I feel very confident. I'm aware that my horses may show signs of pain in both obvious and subtle ways, all the way from reasonably confident, not that confident, to not confident at all. I hope that, Basil, that, that options that have come up, there they are, um, the four options. So whilst you're answering that poll question, I just want to introduce you to our presenter for tonight, and in many ways needs no introduction, um, Sue Dyson, who has joined us before on our Wednesday webinars, is a graduate from an outstanding university, of course, um, and a, a, a huge sort of um, lifetime of interest in the performance horse and indeed in poor performance. And uh, she's past president of the British Equine Veterinary Association and rides regularly outside work um, up to, to, to a high level too. 
and a quirky fact that you might know not th- about Sue, and this has got World Cup connections because Sue won the Cooper Sale Jim Carner Donkey Derby and the 14 2 pony jumping class on the same day as the England football k- team last won the World Cup. That's what it says there. If you know, England only won the World Cup once. So when they did win the World Cup back in 1966. So the question I hear you ask is, what is Sue Dyson doing on the 17th of December 2022? We'll find out in a second. But before we do that, we'll go to the poll results. Basil, if you've got a moment, if you can put that up for us just to see where people are, are, are feeling. Look at that. So. The vast majority, three quarters of you, are reasonably confident. What we never do with these polls is ask them later on to see. Hopefully, more will go from reasonably into the very confident. But it's a good split there. No one's, hardly anyone is um, not confident at all, but a good split over the others. So so thank you very much for getting involved in that. I will close that. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to welcome Sue to the stage and say, Sue, over to you. Right. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, I'm just trying to shift things in order to be able to open my presentation. For some reason. There we go. There we go. Yeah, you're in. I'm in. Yeah, that's looking great. You've not got any grey bars anywhere? I can't see any grey bars. I can see a lot of colour. Okay. Right. So I am talking about myth busting tonight. I think the horse world is embedded in tradition and we use some fairly archaic terminology. For example, we say we're breaking horses in. I think that with today's uh, interest in social license, perhaps this is a term that we need to get rid of. We talk about the horse being on the bit. Do we mean the horse is standing on the bit? If it's behind the bit, what do we mean by that? And then we have lots of myths. Myths that I believe are not based on evidence. Misleading concepts that do not ask the question, why? And I ask the question, have we lost sight of what normal should look like? Normal to me means harmony, willingness, cooperation and partnership. And I don't think that we necessarily see that all the time. So my focus is I want to promote ethical and harmonious horsemanship. I realize that there are members of the riding community that have differing views on what we should or should not use horses for. My viewpoint is that I think, for example, horses love jumping, assuming that they have the ability to jump and that we ride them well. And the photograph of me and Osterburn, I think on the right, shows what I believe is a happy horse. I think that it is really important that we know about learning theory, how horses are best taught. We always need to think about the horse, tack, rider, triad. We also need to think about the horse's mental well being, the fact that turnout and social interaction are important. We need to be learning from our mistakes. I made many mistakes. I rode all of my horses in the same Steuben saddle. I never had the saddle fit checked. That was dreadful, but I've learned that that was not right. And when faced with something that we think is not normal, we need to be asking why? Why is that horse doing this strange behavior? So let's consider some things that I can sit think are myths. My horse has a hind limb toe drag. My coach says he has a lazy hind limb. But what do we mean by a lazy hind limb? 
Are we just me making an excuse for the horse actually being lame? We do believe that some horses have what we call laterality. No human being walks totally symmetrically. Why should a horse move totally symmetrically? In reality, they don't. But that degree of asymmetry associated with what we call laterality is usually not seen naked eye. We measure it using objective measurements of horses movement. And we cert it's certainly not manifest as a toe drag. Could it be related to weakness? But why should a horse be weak on only one hind limb? That doesn't make logical sense. The rider's weight distribution could influence the way a horse moves. So if the rider is sitting over to the right hand side and the horse constantly drags the right hind toe, that could be a reflection of the rider's weight distribution. In fact, inducing an asymmetry of gait, which may over a period of time result in a pain related gait abnormality or lameness. But the most common cause of a unilateral, that's a one-sided toe drag, is in fact lameness. To say it's lazy is just disguising the fact that the horse has an underlying, maybe low-grade pain-related problem. The next issue, my eight-year-old dressage horse working at medium level has a mild but continual bilateral hind limb toe drag. So both the left and the right hind limbs are toe dragged. My trainer tells me that he needs to be energized. I must do more transitions within paces and between paces, but the toe drag continues. The trainer still says repeatedly, create more energy. So what might be the cause of this bilateral hind limb toe drag, both the right and the left hind limb toes dragging through the surface of the arena? It could be lack of fitness. It could be lack of musculoskeletal strength and coordination. The footing of the arena may be poor, in which case most horses would drag their toes through a deep surface arena. It could be due to what we call a scirrus cord, and that's infection associated with previous castration, in a gelding, of course, or mastitis in a mare. Here we're dealing with a gelding, and this gelding was gelded five years previously, so it's very unlikely that the toe drag is associated with a scirrus cord. It could be a reflection of poor hind limb impulsion and engagement. And the question is, does that reflect the way in which the horse has been trained or is it a physical limitation because the horse has discomfort? Or could it be associated with a neurologically mediated weakness or ataxia or lack of coordination? If there was lack of coordination, by observing the horse turn around its length in small circles, we might see abnormal movement of the outside hind limb, as we see on the picture on the left, with the leg being swung outwards. Or if pushed backwards, the horse may take abnormal steps, like leaving the left forelimb in an abnormal position, as we see in the photograph on the right. But remember, this was an eight-year-old dressage horse working at medium level. It's unlikely that it has lack of fitness. It is unlikely that it has lack of coordination. It is most likely that it has either a pain induced lack of hind limb impulsion and engagement, or this reflects the way in which the horse has been trained. Now I want to mention the ridden horse pain ethogram or the ridden horse performance checklist. This is a series of 24 behaviors the majority of which are at least 10 times more likely to be seen in a horse with musculoskeletal pain than a non-lame horse. A ridden horse performance checklist of score of eight or more 
indicates the presence of musculoskeletal pain. Although some lame horses have a ridden horse pain uh, performance checklist score of less than eight. So I think we need to look at the whole horse and ask whether or not it's showing any more of the behaviors that are in the ridden horse performance checklist to help us identify whether or not that bilateral hind limb toe drag was associated with other abnormal clinical signs as well. Now the next myth is, my horse is always spooking, but she has a nervous disposition. So why might a horse spook? Is it because it's being frightened by something? If so, with appropriate retraining, we should be able to abolish this tendency to spook. Is this horse spooking at an unfamiliar object? If so, then we need to train the horse to respond to the rider's cues so that it has trust in the rider, so that it does not spook. We also have to ask the question, are you as a rider anticipating an avoidance reaction? Is there something that you are doing in anticipation of the horse doing something that is being transmitted to the horse that is influencing its behavior? Could it be that the horse's eyesight is impaired? That would be pretty unusual. We know that horses can have one eye, one eye can be removed and those horses perform absolutely normally. They've won at Burley three day event. The other question we have to ask has, is does the horse has, um, have underlying pain? Spooking is one of the 24 behaviors of the ridden horse performance checklist. My horse has always been grumpy, but that's how she is. She's a chestnut mare. In my experience, pain-free horses are not grumpy. A mare may show some degree of fluctuation of behavior with the estrus cycle. But there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that horses with different colors have different temperaments, that they're more likely or not to be grumpy. This chestnut horse, to me, looks pretty happy. In my experience, most grumpy horses show other signs consistent with discomfort. So look at this horse on the right. This is a chestnut horse. Its ears are back and its ears were back for five seconds or more. So I'm using some definitions here from the ridden horse performance checklist or the ridden horse pain ethogram. It has an intense stare for five seconds or more. It shows repeated tail swishing. The bit is pulled through to the left-hand side of the horse's mouth. In addition, we can also observe and these are not signs of the ridden horse pain ethogram, that the lips are separated. The nostrils are dilated, they're spread wide open, and there's tension in the muscles between the nostrils. And all of this contribute to a picture of a horse that's not really comfortable. So I believe that most grumpy horses are actually grumpy because they're uncomfortable. So the next. My horse is a real gentleman, but I do have to kick a lot. He's just really lazy. Well, I believe that a well-trained horse should be responsive to a rider's cues. So if we apply a leg cue or a leg aid, the horse should respond by moving forwards willingly. Now, it's certainly true to say that if I gave conflicting cues, so if I pressed the accelerator but had the handbrake on, my car would judder and my horse might do the same thing. 
Or it could be that my horse is inadequately trained, so he doesn't know how to respond to the leg cues. In that instance, I need to improve the training. And it may be that there may have to be strategic use of a whip or spurs to fine tune the horse's response to a leg cue. Then we have to think, why? What are the other reasons that this horse may be unresponsive to a leg cues? The horse may be uncomfortable. Is that discomfort related to the tack, to musculoskeletal injury, or rider size and their weight distribution? Let's look at this picture. This horse has got its ears back. It has an intense stare. The front of the head is in front of a vertical position more than 30 degrees for more than 10 seconds, and the tail is being held crookedly to the left. Just in this photograph, I can see four behaviors included in the ridden horse painethogram. And remember, if the horse shows eight or more signs of those behaviors within a work period, then it is highly likely that it has underlying musculoskeletal pain. So we need to look at the whole horse. Are there other abnormalities potentially indicating discomfort? So with respect to this horse, we can see that the ears are back. It again has an intense stare. Look at the head position. It's swishing its tail as well. This is another horse that doesn't want to go forward. It's having to be kicked and given verbal encouragement. But the reason is because it's got underlying musculoskeletal pain. My horse is a stressy individual and therefore seems to be prone to gastric ulceration. So I have to manage her diet really carefully. Gastric ulceration is an interesting condition, which is usually occurring secondary to a stress or, so something that is inducing stress in that horse. So if we have adapted the management, so that the horse has an appropriate diet, including enough forage in the diet, and it also has an adequate period of turnout with enough room to move about freely, and also has social interactions with other horses, we have to then ask, why is this horse suffering for, from recurrent gastric ulceration? What is the stress all? Well, the most common stress all is the presence of musculoskeletal pain. And we have to remember that the absence of overt lameness does not preclude musculoskeletal pain. We think of lameness as being the horse limping on a single limb, but if the horse has got pain in more than one limb, it may not limp. And horses being prey animals, have developed remarkable adaptations to the presence of pain to make them appear pain-free. So they adapt their gaits to minimize discomfort. They reduce the range of motion of the back or the thoracolumbar sacral region. That results in the tail swinging less than normally. They reduce their step lengths. They lower the height of arc of foot flight. They reduce extension of the fetlock joints because they're not loading the uncomfortable limbs normally. They increase duty factor. Duty factor is the proportion of the stride length that any single limb is on the ground. With a lame horse, they increase the duration of the time that the limbs spend on the ground to distribute load better between all four limbs. And they may also alter head, neck and trunk posture. So gastric ulcer syndrome gets blamed for changes in performance. However, the European College of Equine Internal Medicine issued a consensus statement saying, do gastric ulcers themselves, in the absence of other clinical signs, have an effect on performance? Have you ever thought about what the underlying cause might actually be? 
what evidence is there that gastric ulcer syndrome is actually the cause of poor performance? There is very, very little evidence in the scientific literature. And particularly if the ulcers are low grade, why should they have a great influence on performance? In a study that we performed, when we were looking at the behavior of horses being tacked up and mounted, historically, 31 of the 193 horses had undergone gastroscopy. So that's inserting um, a telescope-like instrument into the stomach in order to inspect the internal lining of the stomach because they had been performing poorly. Ulcers were identified in 84% of these horses and all of them underwent treatment with omiprazole, the most appropriate treatment. However, only 52% of these horses showed own and reported improvement in performance after treatment. And when we examined these horses, the vast majority were lame. So I would like to suggest to you that many of these horses with underlying uh, recurrent gastric ulceration actually have a primary lameness problem, which is the underlying cause. So the next myth. My trainer says that if a horse's ears are forward, this implies that the horse is not listening to my aids. But this horse looks like a pretty happy horse to me. This horse, Vallegro, ridden by Charlotte Dujada. Are the ears back? No, they're rotated to the side. Horses have very mobile ears. And with a pain-free horse, for most of the time, the ears will be either forwards, erect, or rotated outwards. They will not be backwards. As a rider, you are giving cues with your hands, the seat, your trunk, your legs, with or without the voice. The voice is forbidden in dressage. So why should the horse's ears be back if it's paying attention? Ears back for five seconds or more usually reflects discomfort. That discomfort could be through primary musculoskeletal pain, tack induced pain, or the rider's weight distribution. And even when jumping, a normal horse, when over the jump and landing has its ears forward, if its ears are back on landing, as we see in the picture on the right, that usually reflects discomfort. And look at the way this horse's eyes are semi-closed as well. Look at the horse on the left compared with the horse on the right. The horse on the right has got his ears pricked as it's jumping. That's what's normal for horses. To have the ears back over the top of a fence is highly abnormal and usually reflects discomfort. My horse leans on my right hand. That means that the rein tension in the right rein is excessive but I am right-handed. So this is my dominant hand and I probably overuse it. Well, that might be the case, but much more often, asymmetrical rein tension is actually induced by the horse. You need to ask the question, if you've got this problem, does the horse hang on the rein with other more skilled riders? Or does the, we get the same thing with every rider who sits on the horse? If the bit is being pulled through to one side, we have to think, what is the underlying problem likely to be? So first of all, we have to assess the mouth, the bridle, the bit, and the temporomandibular joints. So injuries of the teeth, the lips, the bars of the horse's mouth, the buccal mucosa or the inside lining of the teeth, cheek or the tongue could have the potential to cause asymmetrical rein tension. Likewise, an unsuitably fitted bit and the integrity of the bit may cause a horse to lean on one side. The fit and suitability of the noseband has to be considered, as does pain associated with the temporomandibular joints. In my clinical experience, Lameness is by far and away the most common cause. And this bit being pulled through to the one side is a result of the adaptation of the horse's movement. And it can reflect a reluctance to turn. 
Most horses, in my experience, which induce asymmetrical rein tension have hind limb discomfort. And if we take away the pain from the hind limbs using nerve blocks, then rein tension immediately becomes more symmetrical and the contact feels far more even in the rider's hands. My horse leans on the bit. Rein tension is excessive, but similar on both reins. My trainer says that I must go to a gym to work on my core strength so that I can support the horse better. Well, there certainly are some exuberant horses that riders find it difficult to sit on, and they may start to um, try to restrain the horse excessively by overusing their rein aids, and the horse may retaliate by pulling back. But this excessive rein tension in both hands is usually the result of inadequate hind limb impulsion and engagement because the horse is working on the forehand. It could reflect the rider skill and their inability to remain stable and in balance and to apply the cues correctly. But it is much more likely in my experience that this reflects an underlying pain related problem with the horse. So once again, we have to ask, does the problem persist with a more skilled rider? And if yes, then it's highly likely that it reflects discomfort and unwillingness to engage the hind limbs. A more skilled rider may improve the gait quality, but the, a more skilled rider is unable to disguise other behavioral abnormalities consistent with pain. So if we apply the ridden horse performance checklist, we may see that although the horse is moving better, that the behavioral signs consistent with discomfort persist. So we could think about doing a pain relief trial. So for example, administering phenylbutazone at a dose suitable for the horse's body weight. So I would suggest approximately two sachets twice daily for at least seven days. And we need to document the horse's ridden performance before starting the phenylbutazone for a number of days, during the, the phenylbutazone trial, and also after the trial. Improvement in performance during treatment or deterioration in performance after treatment is highly likely to reflect the presence of underlying pain. However, not all sources of pain respond to pain relief, paradoxically. So a negative response to phenylbutazone does not preclude the presence of pain. My seven-year-old horse, which competes at British Eventing 100 level, keeps going disunited around the short sides of the arena. My trainer says that it is because I don't sit up enough, but it happens when my friend rides the horse and she is a much better rider than me. Canter is an asymmetrical gait. So we see the horse on the right in right lead canter, which is initiated by the trailing outside left hind limb, which bears weight alone. And this is quite a big ask for all the weight of the horse to be borne by a single limb. Young horses, which lack musculoskeletal strength and coordination, may struggle to maintain canter, particularly around the short sides of an arena. However, most canter problems in a mature horse, which has been appropriately trained, reflect either hind limb with or without lumbosacroiliac joint region discomfort. My horse trips quite a lot, but he is a bit of a clumsy individual. He's a big horse and only seven years of age, so he just needs more time to develop. True or false? Skeletal maturity is reached at an approximately six years of age. There is some degree of variation among horses. But if this horse has been in regular work since four years of age, and it's pain-free, and it has no neurological deficit, and it's been regularly trimmed, and the work surfaces are well-maintained, 
a horse should not trip or stumble. Tripping or stumbling is usually caused by either a lack of hind limb flexion because of pain, alteration in neuromuscular pathways because of pain resulting in altered foot placement, or as the result of a primary neurological deficit. Look at this horse. It has an intense stare. The front of the head is slightly behind the vertical position. It's showing repeated tail swishing. Just in this photograph, it's showing signs of musculoskeletal discomfort, which are part of the ridden horse performance checklist. My horse usually jumps well, but does not like drop fences or steps down. I think that's just because he has taken a dislike to this type of fence. Unwillingness to jump going downhill or drop fences or jumping down into water may reflect a lack of confidence. However, we have to bear in mind that jumping downhill increases the load on the forelimbs on landing. And a horse may not show overt lameness, but landing may induce pain. Jumping downhill also increases load through the front of the saddle. So if the, front of, if the saddle does not fit optimally, pain may be induced by landing. The stopping may be in anticipation of pain. We also have to consider other factors. If the horse then does jump and the rider inadvertently gets left behind and therefore inadvertently jabs the horse in the mouth or lands heavily on the back, the horse is then being punished for judgment, for jumping. And this is bad. This is a bad reflection of training. The horse is being punished for doing something you asked it to do. Now, as a rider, you may naturally become somewhat defensive if you're anticipating that the horse may stop. And defensive riding may compound the problem. The horse needs confidence in the rider and stopping may become a habitual behavior for which we need retraining. My horse has never wanted to stand still at the mounting block, but he is a really goey horse. So this reflects his character. Unwillingness to stand at the mounting block may reflect inadequate training. But let's assume that the training has been correct. Why else might the horse move off from the mounting block? It may be because the horse is anticipating pain, either pain from an ill-fitting saddle or musculoskeletal pain when the horse is ridden. And even if we were to remove that pain, this tendency to move away from the mounting block when mounting may become habitual, requiring retraining even when we resolve the underlying pain. So my take home messages are, don't always blame the horse or the rider. Be sure that you know what is normal. Recognize what is abnormal behavior and ask why. Consider using the ridden horse performance checklist and get professional help. We have released today a document available via the World Horse Welfare website calling, called Mythbusters. Is your horse in pain or being a pain? Busting some of the myths about horse behavior. In this, you will also find the ridden horse performance checklist. Thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sue, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant and reflected in the fact that we've had so many questions already. So we really look forward to getting to those. Just a reminder, if you're on Facebook, put them in the comments section. If you're on um, Zoom, use the Q&A function. But we've got so many already. What will be really good is if you could upvote existing questions. So if the question is what you were going to ask or similar to what you were going to ask, then please do upvote that question. Now.
Uh, I need to share my screen again, and we're going to um, move on to our second poll question, which is how likely do you think most horse owners would be to consider that their horse's unwanted behaviour could be pain related? Clearly, it might be influenced by what you just heard from Sue, but you've got four options there from very likely, quite likely, possibly, and not very likely. So whilst you are answering that, I'm going to introduce uh, Sue's fellow panellist, Rosa Vervice, who's from Rittle University College and is a, um, a certified horse behaviour uh, consultant, a member of the International Association of Animal Behaviour Consultants and Animal Behaviour and Training Councils. And as you can see, it's very active within the equine space with the BHS and the National Equine Welfare Council too. Um, Rosa um, does have her quirky fact doesn't have anything to do with the World Cup, unfortunately, uh, but it is still a very good one. She won a clay budget shooting competition on a hen weekend, uh, apparently about seven years ago, and now shoots clays as a hobby. She's passionate about elf, uh, animal welfare but shows no mercy to clay pigeons. Um, well done, Rosa. Doesn't say what what, what the the, the, um, the bride, whether she is joined there on, on those uh, clay pigeon days. Um, and just to let you know that we have a truly international audience. We've got people from all over the UK, including the Isle of Man. We've got people from all over uh, Europe, uh, Sweden, Germany, Israel, Finland, Czech Republic, Austria. I would say um, Maria from France, uh, clearly uh, I'm, I'm very aware that France will have an um, influence on whether England do or do not get to the semi-final. So wishing you the best of luck. Um, and also really want to say a big hello to Victor from Ukraine. But we also have um, to show the global nature of this evening from Canada, USA and Australia. Um, and R Rosa, who um, is joining us, uh, uh, just to let you know, Frederica, from Rittle University is watching as well. So she's clearly monitoring just a bit of quality control going on there. So before we get into the questions, Basil, can you give us the answer to the poll that we've just done? So look, how likely do you think most horners that would be to consider that their horses on one baby could be pain related? That is bottom heavy. So 27% of you think, so about a quarter of you think very likely or quite likely, but the vast majority think possibly or not very likely. So hence the reason for th this evening's or today's um, webinar, which I hope that you will consider sharing with your friends so, so we can really change those numbers so more are very likely or quite likely. So I'm going to stop sharing my um, screen and move on to some questions. So um, um, just a reminder, please do upvote those questions on Zoom. So Rachel, I'm going to come to you. I mean, obviously, I, I'm sure a lot of what Sue uh, just spoke about resonated with you. But how do you ensure that if you're called uh, to, out to support a horse owner looking to resolve a certain issue, behavioural, in their horse, how do you ensure that their horse is not actually in pain? Thank you. Um, and just thank you to Sue for such a fantastic talk and, and drawing people's attention to the behavioural side of these behaviours um, that horses are doing and how it can be pain. And that's something that we have to be really aware of as behaviourists is that when we are seeing a horse that we do try to rule out pain as a first port of call. And as a behaviourist, that's not our remit. So we like to work as part of a vet led team and we generally will refer our clients to seek referral to their vet, get the vet to check that the horse is okay um, and that they are free from pain, which can be quite difficult. Um, pain isn't always obvious, as Sue's pointed out. There can be multiple reasons for these behaviours that we're seeing. Um, so sometimes potentially it can get missed or clients might be thinking that they've checked it out and they haven't. So that's something that we like to do ethically is make sure that these horses are pain free and not just throw on a, a training program to try and resolve um, the behavioural issue. And just as a rider to that, uh, Rosa, I mean, ballpark, I mean, how when you go out and see cases, how many actually are pain related and how many are not pain related? Is it is it half and half? Or is it not as not as simple as that? Um, I say probably around half and half. There's an awful lot of behavioural issues such as aggression um, and fear that can be exacerbated by pain. So we often do very closely look for pain because even if it's not obvious, um, like the horse has a loading problem or fear of something, 
that pain could be exacerbating that, as in sort of Sue's example, looking at the gastric ulcers, often we're seeing that there's underlying lameness and that's where we're seeing that stress build up. So with horses, it's lots of factors building up that can result in the sort of end behaviour that we see. But often, I think sometimes for behaviourists, we're a bit of a last port of call. So by the time we do get asked to come out, the horse's behavioural issue is often quite serious. Um, so it might be a little bit more obvious that there is a pain issue yeah. going on there. Yeah, I see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sue, once you have ruled out pain b- being the cause of a certain behaviour, what do you advise owners to do next? Well, first of all, I think you have to realise that it's very difficult to absolutely rule out pain. That's one of the most challenging things to say, I'm absolutely sure your horse does not have pain. It's much easier to say your horse does have pain. Um, But if the horse doesn't, I truly, truly believe that the horse doesn't have pain, then I have to look at the rider and ask myself, does this, is this rider competent to retrain this horse or do they need help? And do they need help from a behaviorist or do they need help from a physiotherapist to help them in their position and their strength and ability? Do they need help from a riding coach or do they need a combined approach? And often it's a combined approach Mm -hmm. um, because the rider loses confidence, generally speaking. When, When they're faced with behavioral problems, most amateur owners lose confidence in their own ability. So they have to psychologically be able to adapt to the fact that with help, they may be able to deal with this difficult horse. I'm not using the term naughty, I'm saying difficult horse. But I think it takes a team approach and we have to be dealing with the rider's psychology. And we also have to be dealing with the horse's mental state as well. Because I have to think, well, how is this horse being managed on a day-to-day basis? Is it having appropriate social interaction with other horses? Is it being turned out and getting adequate exercise? Are there other reasons from a management perspective as to why this horse has developed the behaviors that it has? So we have to have a holistic look at the whole situation of management. And um, so if the horse is living on its own, that's not an ideal situation. Horses are herd animals, they need those social interactions. Absolutely. Friends, freedom and forage. Um, you, you mentioned their paraprofessionals. And so, Rosa, I just, what, do you tend to work with other professionals on a regular basis, such as, so you mentioned, you know, physios, osteopaths, r- farriers, uh, saddlers, etc. Or is it more common to work independently and, and just advise the owner to consult um, other professionals? Um, a little bit of both. It, it kind of depends on the problem, the nature of the problem. It also depends on the client and what they've perhaps already been doing. A lot of clients are, are very good. They know their horses really well. They're able to spot when they're not OK. And they've often already perhaps contacted the vet, a physio, a saddle fitter. I see a lot of clients and I'll be like, we might need to look at this. I've already done that. We've been there. So that's fantastic that people know that and are doing the best that they can for their horses as well. Um Quite often, it's really useful for us to be able to speak to firsthand to the vet and to other professionals to get that sort of detail of information, because alongside taking a behavioural history, we also need that clinical history. And as Sue said, looking at sort of the environment as well. So trying to get as much information on to do the sort of your detective work and find out what's going on. Um, But equally going forwards with working with them, especially if we're dealing with fear issues where we have horses where we'd be talking a bit more about cooperative care so fear of you know needle shy horses fear of farrier um, and a lot of those sort of medical processes it's really beneficial to work together with a farrier um, with a vet so that we know what their technique is because if we're training a horse a certain way and then the farrier comes and, and handles the horse completely differently to how we've trained it then that plan's not going to be successful either so working together it's going to be a lot less confusing for the horse and hopefully much more successful. Yeah. And Sue, I take it you, I mean, you talked about the team there. I mean, you, do you work regularly with other professionals? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. 
Now, I, I have historically looked at horses from all sorts of different geographical locations, and sometimes it's not possible to have a one-to-one -one interaction with the horse and the other people, which is the ideal situation, but you can still communicate, and that communication to me is absolutely key. Brilliant. Thank you. Rosa, are there certain behaviours that an owner may explain in an email or over the phone that instantly stand out to you as likely to be pain related? Or is it really important to have to see the force and, and meet the owner in person to truly understand the situation? Um, yes, sometimes things jump out. It's, you know, we're constantly trying to come up with hypotheses of, of what might be the underlying cause for that behaviour. Um, and whilst owners can be really good at spotting things, it's really important for us to be able to try and, and assess with a, a wider range of tools. So, as I said, having a big behavioural history. I mean, our case history forms are a little bit epically long, as some people may know who've taken them. But we're really trying to get all the information that we can, combine that with that clinical history as well, information that we can get from the vet, from the physio that's been seeing them. So there's a lot that we can do. And during things like COVID, um, there were a lot of consults that were perhaps done remotely, but being there in person in assessment is we can often spot sometimes the more subtle signs of behaviour that people might miss. We're also taking in a lot of information from that environment and trying to consider the behavioural well-being of that horse. So the behavioural problem is what's culminated in the client perhaps contacting us and asking us for help. But what I'm also really interested in and the first thing that I want to look at is the general behavioural well-being of that horse. So it's very important that I can see what environment they're living in, um, what's the stables like, is it a stressful environment, is it a calm environment, what are the opportunities there for that horse to perhaps increase their chances of having their behavioural needs met. So that's always a first port of call. So trying to get that information from the client over the phone we usually can get quite a lot of information, um, but it's always been much easier for us to get more information if we can see that firsthand. Brilliant. Thank you, Rhoda. Um, so you talked about terminology earlier, and we know that horses don't have the cognitive ability to intentionally be naughty, but um, people often use that because it's a simple word to use. Should we be more or less relaxed as an industry in terms of the accuracy of the words that we're using to describe horse behaviour? Um, well, I think it helps to differentiate what the underlying problems might be. And certainly there are some challenging horses. I had the good fortune to purchase very cheaply a horse that I thought had remarkable ability, but he reared. And that was his only problem. But he reared to such an extent that you couldn't get out of the yard initially. And if you got out in the yard into the middle of the field, you couldn't go any further. But he didn't show any other problem. And I, through training of this horse, managed to persuade him that rearing was not a particularly good idea and that he could respond to leg cues in the way that I wanted him to. And that horse became an advanced event horse and went to the Olympic Games aged eight. Um, so I, I would regard that horse as a challenging horse and I needed to understand what his problem was and how I could resolve those problems. And I think it's unfortunate to, set, to, to label a horse as naughty because that has bad connotations. Um, so I would prefer to use the terms challenging or difficult, but to recognize the fact that if there are multiple abnormal behaviors, it is highly likely that the horse has underlying musculoskeletal pain yeah. and that we therefore need to investigate it to ask why. So my underlying take home message is ask why the horse is showing whatever abnormal behavior it is. Is it related to the rider, the tack, the environment, how it's being managed? Ask all those questions. You've gone far too early. We're not doing take home messages yet. We're only in the middle of the questions. <laughs> but Rosa, do you, do you correct owners um, when they when they say I've got a naughty horse? Um, not so much correcting. It's I think. The labels that clients will give their horses tells us a lot about how they're feeling about the problem. And a lot of the time, these behaviour problems are an inconvenience to us. And we don't want it. You know, we want to be able to have a really good relationship with our horse and, and get on and ride them and do what we want to do. 
Um, behavior is how horses communicate with us. So by giving them a label, we might be assuming that the horse is perhaps feeling a certain way, which might not really be reflecting what the horse is feeling. And I think if we use kind of these very human terms that my horse is an idiot and he's doing it to annoy me and he is naughty, it gives us kind of an excuse that it's the horse's fault and it's not really our fault. And I think that just removes the responsibility from us to actually deal with it and look into what that problem actually is, where it stems from. Sue's hit the nail on the head with thinking of it more as, yes, it's a challenging behaviour, it's a difficult behaviour, why are they doing it? So if we try and move away from labels, because if I say naughty, everyone who's on this um, webinar is thinking, oh, the horse is rearing, the horse is bucking, the horse is kicking, the horse is biting. It doesn't really tell us the behavior that we're doing. So as a behaviorist, we tend to ask you to really focus on making a note of the behaviors that the horse is showing. As a few Sue's listed in her webinar um, and the, the RHPEs, look through that list, tick off the behaviors that are being shown, and that's giving us more evidence to try and determine what the cause of that behavior is. So if your horse is being naughty, make a note of the behaviors that your horse does that makes you think that they're being naughty or disrespectful or difficult. I do remember many years ago when I had a very bad training session with my horse, the, 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 the coach said, put the horse in the stable and leave it there and let him dwell on how bad he's performed uh, and I, I did it at the time and of course now you realize blimey wh wh why did I do that and um, Sue you've talked a lot about the ridden horse pain ethogram and you also talked about the ridden horse performance checklist uh, is one an evolution of the other uh, how are they related they are exactly the same right. there are some people who didn't want to embrace the term ridden horse pain ethogram because they didn't like the term pain so we said, OK, well, maybe if it's more user friendly, we could just use the ridden horse performance checklist. They are exactly one and the same thing. Brilliant. Thank you. And I, I meant to say earlier, I did love the, your gender in your myth. You, I, I didn't know whether there's a sort of sequence here because he was lazy and clumsy and she was grumpy. I didn't know whether to read anything <laughs> into that, but uh, we can talk about that another time. Now we're into the last, last, last stage because we've got a hum humongous, if that's a technical term, uh, number of questions to get through. Please do upvote uh, any of these questions and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Elena has asked a really good question, Sue. You know, you've obviously talked about pain and that is really important. And the checklist is brilliant. Um, but and they're going to feel a bit rubbish if they're in pain. But what about the mental well-being? Are we going to get a checklist for the mental well-being of our horses, the ones that are stabled on their own or stable for many, many hours with limited turnout? These things are on a high starch diet. These things are uh, actually um, as big a welfare concern. Yeah, I mean, I said right from the start that I believe that we have to be looking at the whole horse. This is a list and holistic approach. And we have to be thinking about the horse's mental well-being. So we have to understand that these are social animals. They need to be out moving because that's physically good for them. They need to be out meeting other animals, interacting with them, because that's what normal horses do. They are herd animals. Um, it's delightful to watch two horses playing together or scratching their withers, etc. So if we remove the opportunity to display those behaviours, of course, it's going to have a potential effect on the horse. So I'm a huge believer that horses need to live as natural in as natural environment as is possible. So I believe that horses should be turned out daily. Although there may be an enhanced injury risk, I think the benefits outweigh the other risks, the downsides. Likewise, they should be turned out with another horse, ideally, or at least should be able to interact over a fence with another horse. And I think thinking about all these aspects, uh, dietary management, not allowing obesity, um, providing access to forage so that the horse can feed episodically throughout the day but perhaps only in small amounts so we provide them with balls with food inside them we provide them with multi-hold hay nets which are doubled or tripled so it takes them longer to eat so we find ways of managing their diets whilst allowing um, them to live more natural lives 
Excellent, Suze, thank you. And that's a wonderful segue to many of the other webinars that are available on our YouTube channel, especially around equine weight management and many of the other issues that uh, Sue just talked about. Rosa, in relation to that first question then, how can we learn to differentiate between pain and fear? That is a difficult question because a lot of the behavioural signs that we see um, in terms of pain and fear and, and sort of heightened arousal can look quite similar. So the triangulated eye and the tense nostrils and, and the tense chewing muscles and the ears as well. We kind of need to look at their emotional thresholds um, and monitor what it is, the stimulus that they're responding to. So if there is a stimulus that is seeming to cause that reaction, then we can perhaps be a little bit more confident that it's fear based, whereas if it's something um, more continuous or seen specifically in relation to being ridden, for example, then that might indicate perhaps that it's more fear. But that's a really good question and it's a difficult one. And I know that there's quite a lot of other research going on to try and, and differentiate between this and give us more clues. What we know now is that we can recognise that the horse is in perhaps a negative emotional state. Um, being able to pinpoint that to fear or to pain is a little bit more difficult, but we know that we've got something there to work with. Sue, so, do you have a thought on that? Yes, I think that fear and pain can be difficult to differentiate. I like to see the horse works in different environments because that sometimes makes an enormous difference. The horse working in the confines of an arena may be very, very different to that horse working outside in the field. And to be able to observe the horse under those different environmental conditions can help me learn a lot. Um, like, likewise, seeing the horse ridden by more than one rider, because the rider themselves may be transmitting their fear to the horse, which has a knock-on effect to the horse's behaviour. And therefore, to see that horse ridden by a more skilled individual can help me tease out the difference. Yeah. Um, question from Deborah Sue. How do you tell, uh, or can you tell, if an unridden horse is in pain? Um, I can watch this horse's demeanour within the stable. I look at some horses and I'm, I'm taking the history from an owner. I'm chatting to the owner standing in the stable and the horse is standing, not interacting with its environment. It's standing with a rather glazed expression in its eye. It's got its ears back. It's shifting its weight between its hind limbs. And it's not interacting with the fact that we have come into the stable. I believe that a normal horse should engage with us. Yeah. So those are all signs to me that something is not right. So um, we haven't developed an ethogram for the non-ridden horse. Other people have done that. There are other studies out which have described the behavior, particularly with respect to facial expressions. Yeah. And if you observe facial expressions, they can be hugely, um, inf give you huge amounts of information. Human, in human medicine, they use facial expressions in neonates and in adult people with dementia, those people that can't communicate to indicate whether or not that individual is experiencing pain or not. And we can do exactly the same thing within the horse. But these are relatively subtle signs. Yeah. Um, but the horse is trying to communicate with us. We just need to learn how to listen to what they're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Rosa, Miriam's asked, why is salivation and mastication at a bit still considered a comfort cue? These behaviours are not observed in a free roaming horse and, and prevent the horse from breathing properly, don't they? Sure. Um. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by comfort cue. I don't know if, if either of you know the answer to that one. Well, it, I think salivation and mastication is not a well, negative comfort. indication. I oh, think. okay. That's the way I was reading that. Okay, as in comfort, discomfort. Yeah. Yes, um, I think that's a big part of tradition as well. And this is something that is difficult to break through because a lot of people are hearing information and we perpetuate that. And we're still seeing that that's always a good sign, similarly to Sue's questions about the horse being on the bit or behind the bit. So a lot of this terminology that people use and think about um, and we don't always question. So I think that salivation where we might see that as signs of releasing tension, that the horse is relaxing, perhaps the jaw muscle, they're starting to lick and chew, perhaps once they're over um, a slightly stressful event that's happened, 
we would see it that way. Um, it's also, we see this sort of licking and chewing as a sign of submission. If we're looking at um, some of the trainers that are working out there as well. And it's it's all the different information that's coming through. So I think the answer to that question is perhaps just that those people haven't been told the information about that sort of licking and chewing and mouthing the bit and producing saliva. Ch challenging the status quo. Um, Sue, Elena has asked some great questions. Why is it, is it accepted that such a high proportion of competition horses and race horses have ulcers? That it, it seems to be an accepted fact. How is that ethical? I think that's a good question, and and unquestionably, it's it's not it's not ethical. Um, and we we need to dispel the myth, I think, that gastric ulcers are a primary problem. When they're not a primary problem, by and large, we have to understand what is the stress or, and that reflects, and the the fact that we have such a high prevalence of ulcers reflects that we have a high prevalence of lameness. And why do we have a high prevalence of lameness? Um, are we breeding horses which are predisposed to lameness or does it reflect our training or does it reflect the surfaces on which we're working the horses or does it reflect our general management practices or is it a combination of all these factors? Yeah. And I think these are the questions that we need to be addressing. Yeah. Um, I thought the next question is strange name, Samsung. I thought, no, that's obviously the device they're calling in on, but it's Samsung. What did a panel think about pain memory? And Rosa, I don't know if you want to have a crack at this one. I'm currently in early stages after stifle ops and ulcers, but just wonder if attitude from my mare after these things are cleared could be pain memory. So that's obviously stifle off and ulcers for her mare. Uh, and, uh, and how do I differentiate this? If it's a pain memory or is it existing pain? That's a really good question. And a lot of horses that have perhaps been in pain for quite a while have adapted their behaviour. They've adapted how they cope with life to deal with that pain. And just because we've undertaken surgery, they don't really have knowledge that that process is going to undo the pain for them. So most horses will react on anticipation of that pain that might be coming. If they associate you bringing the tack, that's still going to hurt. Or we're going out into the arena, you're going to work me. It's probably going to hurt. And even the first few times that they then work and it doesn't hurt, they're still anticipating that pain. So we often see that pain response, which we often talk about as memory of pain or guarding behavior. So that's a really difficult one for us to work through. And then can also make us second guess, is my horse now pain free? Because they're still showing those signs of pain. So that's again where we need to work together with your vet make sure that the horse is progressing well, they are recovering, but also giving them time to recover um, and go through that process. I think I need to jump in here in that yeah. we know if we've got a lame horse and we perform nerve blocks and we successfully remove all the sources of pain, then that horse will immediately improve in its behavior, immediately during ridden exercise. So the behaviours that they're showing during ridden exercise, by and large, but not exclusively, are not habitual. But if the horse is showing abnormal behaviour during tacking up and mounting, it will take several months after the resolution of the underlying pain for those behaviours to resolve. Yeah. So I think there's a difference between mm. the behaviours we observe from the ground versus those that we observe when the horse is ridden. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, Sue, maybe one for you, uh, Rosa, you might have a comment too. From Nicola, how can we change the attitudes of judges, the FEI and other equine professionals to take account of the findings of your research? Um, well, I, I think that we are going to train horses if we're competitors to be successful in front of judges. So if we're performing dressage, either as pure dressage or as part of the eventing, we are going to train horses, unless we are very strong-minded, to gain the marks that the judges will give us for what we think they want. At the moment, I believe that judges are not penalizing adequately the head being behind the vertical position 
or lack of hind limb engagement and impulsion, or repeated tail swishing, or repeated opening of the mouth. So I think that we need to educate judges to recognize these behaviors and not reward them. And I have to say the British dressage are aware of this and they want to be proactive in this respect. Yeah. And that's and, fantastic. Fantastic. And it, but it's true to say if, if you're into, I mean, obviously you hope people would just primarily want their horse to be pain free. But if you're performing with that horse, by definition, a horse that's pain free is going to do better than a horse that's in pain. Is it, is it not that simple? Absolutely. I mean, we've demonstrated that with studies at low level eventing, five star level eventing, upper level dressage, slightly lower level dressage. Yes, those horses that perform best are pain free. Um, so it's a yes, it's a win win situation. Yeah. If your horse is pain free, it will probably do better. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Rosa and Julie's asked about she has a two year of Connor, Connemara mare. And every time she approaches someone or is approached by someone, she pins her ears back. Uh, most times this, this behaviour doesn't escalate and she's happy to be in your company, but her ears are still back. I'm not sure whether this is fear or frustration related. Do you have any advice? Uh, advice is hard to give. I'd want to ask perhaps what other behaviours she might be doing. Um, pinning ears can be almost like a, a habitual response sometimes if she's learned that you move away, perhaps. Um, and that works for her. Horses tend to do what behaviour works for them. And if it doesn't work, they don't do it. Now, that's a very simplistic way of looking at behaviour. But equally, horses are, are very responsive to sort of what's going on in the here and the now. She's not plotting beforehand, oh, you're coming, I'm going to put my ears back. It's perhaps the association she's making. So maybe it's when you're approaching with tap. It might even be when you're approaching with food because she's perhaps hungry or you're approaching with really tasty food that she's desperate to have and hasn't had it for a while. And that can cause some conflicting emotions. So it can be quite difficult. And, and this is something that's not that uncommon is, is with horses that have these conflicting emotions is I want to see you and I'm happy with you, but I'm also a little bit not sure. So it could be a little bit of um, defensive behaviour just that initial reaction horses want to stay safe they are a prey animal so it's always react first and then perhaps think and process a little bit later brilliant um so jennifer's asked can tension and anxiety and anxiety be demonstrated by the same pain ethogram or a selection of the same elements um tension is not something that is easily measurable and is not included in the ethogram for that reason, um, because we have no really good descriptors of it. But it is something that I always take into account. So I talk about rideability. The horse should be acceptant of the rider's leg cues, for example. You sometimes get on a horse which is performing poorly and you feel like you're sitting on this explosive time bomb waiting for something to happen. So you don't put your legs on. But when you take away that pain, the horse immediately says, Phew. and you can then apply leg cues in a more normal way. So I believe that tension is a hugely um, important aspect to consider, but it is not part of the ridden horse pain ethogram because it is very difficult to define and very difficult for you um, Rosa and myself to say this horse definitely has tension. So the, the, the behaviours that we've included in the ridden horse pain ethogram are supposed to be behaviours that everybody should be able to recognise and repeatedly agree on, whereas tension is a very much more subjective appraisal. But I do believe that a normal horse is not a tense horse. Um, for a variety of different reasons. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Rosa, Tessa has asked, my horse continually wants to stretch her head right down to the ground and walk. Do you think this could be due to pain? It's not just after wanting to stretch after working correctly. And she tends to get tense or jog if I try and pull the reins down, if I try to take a contact. 
Yes, absolutely, it could be. And if she's stretching down repeatedly, that's possibly because she's uncomfortable. It might be because she's anticipating bit pressure. She's perhaps evading that. And it can just be a displacement behaviour. So sometimes we might see behaviours that aren't obviously related to what we're dealing with at the moment. So you might just think she might just resist the bit. Why is she putting her head down and away? Um, that could be a, a self-calming behaviour. It could be a soothing behaviour or, or just something that she's found that helps her to cope with that thing. It makes it really hard for us sometimes to spot abnormal behaviours too. Um, but Sue might have more to add on to that one of, of a horse stretching the head down. I think in the majority of instances, it does reflect underlying discomfort. And it's the way they feel most comfortable to be moving. Um, but it may, in fact, mask to an extent what that underlying problem might be because they're moving in their most comfortable fashion. And it may be that I have to ask the rider to ride the horse to a contact so that then I can better evaluate the gait modifications, which are the result of its discomfort. Yeah. But I would say probably in the vast majority, it will reflect underlying discomfort. Brilliant. We are getting towards the end and we've still got a mountain of questions to get through. So um, I think we're now going to go for a little bit of a quick fire if we can. So I, I appreciate many of these we can't do yes or no, but if we can keep the answers as tight as possible, we'll see how many we get. Um, Sue, Tams Infotado, a name very familiar to us, um, has asked, if you were given a young horse who you wanted to compete long term, at uh, what ages would you choose to introduce initial ridden work and then competitive level, level work? Um, I would start ridden work at three, but slowly, progressively, um, with breaks, and I would consider competing the horse from five years of age, assuming that it was a fairly mature horse. And I do think that different horses vary in their speed or maturation. Brilliant. Now, Sue, Bethan's asked a question, but it's very long. I don't know if you can have a look at it, but whilst I'm going to ask um, a question to Rosa, if you could read Bethan's question, that would be brilliant. Um, uh, the question from Eve, Rosa, if the horse is having a negative behaviour reaction to being ridden, are there any baseline or common evidence that we can gather for the vet for when they come out to see the horse? So in that regard, what, what would you advise the owners? That's a really great question. And trying to sort of find a way to map um, and, and document that. When does it happen? What's happening before you see that behaviour? Perhaps what cues are you giving? And what happens perhaps after that behaviour has happened? Because we need to see what's maintaining that behaviour, um, which is going to give your vet perhaps some more insight as to whether it's pain related behaviour or whether it's a learned response as well. So trying to take some notes down, um, find out what the routine is. That would be really helpful. Brilliant. So, Sue, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to read Bethan's. I mean, obviously, she's th there's been a lot of intervention into this mare who was at Appleby and raced at Appleby 18 months ago and has had a lot of surgical and uh, looks like maintenance is tip top in terms of monthly physio, new saddle, teeth up to date. Any thoughts for, for Bethan? Well, I just think there must be some underlying residual pain that hasn't been identified because it's just not normal for a horse to be grumpy whilst it's being tacked up. So although the saddle fit has been checked, I know that I've seen horses when the saddle was checked last week, but it's still not right. So I would revisit that area. There may be other areas of musculoskeletal pain that the horse may experience during ridden exercise, despite the fact that it seems more comfortable during ridden exercise. I can't think that there isn't pain coming from somewhere. Brilliant, thank you. And, and the best of luck with, with, with your mare. Um, Rosa, uh, Rachel's asked, she, she finds it really difficult to, to get people to consider horses' bad behaviour might be caused by pain. What's the best way to bring people round without sounding preachy and a know-all? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I think empowering people to be able to understand how their horse is communicating is really important. So signposting them to perhaps a list of behaviours that can tell them if their horse is relaxed and comfortable or if they're perhaps a bit more agitated and also that list of pain behaviours. Giving that client or that, that person the ability to see it for themselves rather than telling them is a really key way of, of getting people to perhaps make those changes to their behaviour and perceptions. 
Brilliant. Um, Lucinda's asked, Lucinda, so is an equine practitioner. She says, when when people, when owners tell their horses rearing or bucking, I relay that, that the horse is shouting. And she tends to, 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 to find that that works quite well. But she regularly see horses in pain. People that do not recognize pain in their horses often assume that practitioners only work on broken horses. They do not see body work as necessary maintenance. Um, would you agree with Lucinda? Absolutely. I mean, I think we have to have a holistic approach to horses. I can treat a problem that I identify, but I need help for the whole horse because I think to optimize performance, we have to do everything in our power to make sure the shoeing is correct, the trimming is correct, the saddle fit is correct, the bridle fit is correct, and the, the musculature is being developed in the right way which reflects training and help from um, body workers of whatever sort. Brilliant. Um, Helen has asked, uh, Rosa, is all this information taught at equine colleges? You're the best person to ask. So, so that the next generation of equine grooms and instructors know about it. Interestingly, she's also asked about pony clubs and riding clubs. And Caroline has actually just mentioned in the chat the fact that the whole pony club test system is being updated to talk about equine learning theory, the five domains. So it's certainly happening in the pony clubs. Is it happening in the equine colleges? Absolutely. Um, a lot of equine colleges and universities have behavioural components to their courses. There are also several universities that have behaviour specific degrees, such as at Ritual University College, we run equine behavioural science. And looking more at sort of the interface level at Pony Club and the BHS, they're all working really hard. There's so much going on behind the scenes that I perhaps no one knows about where Everyone's trying to get the best information possible. Um, the National Equine Welfare Council as well. Everyone is working collegiately, this multidisciplinary team to try and do the best for our horses. So the information's coming through and it's coming through at pony club level. It's coming through in riding schools. It just takes a little bit of time for these changes to take place. I have to say that I think the veterinary world is lagging behind at the moment, sadly. That's a really interesting. I was going to ask you too. So what can we do about that? Well, we, we have to get more veterinary surgeons on board and we have to be teaching more about behaviour at vet schools. I think there's no doubt about that. Yeah. And it, 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 is, it has a very, very, very small part of the curriculum at the moment. Yes, and the constant shy with any or cry with any curriculum is it's all too busy, but maybe the priority is not there. But that's for another day, I think. But it, it, you make a really good point. Um, Sheena uh, has asked if novice riders, particularly in riding schools, are causing horses pain through lack of balance uh, and causing the horse to com compensate. Would you agree lunge lessons and mechanical horses would be a way forward? Um, that's a yes from Sue. Is that a yes from Rosa as well? Excellent. Now, M M Mandy's asked a long question. I'm going to get to that. The Facebook has asked someone on Facebook, can on unresponsiveness, unresponsiveness to leg aids be related to negative emotions, Sue? Uh, to negative emotions? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think there's a, a short answer to this. Um, a, a correctly cha chained horse should respond to light leg cues. If it doesn't, Either the training has been wrong or there's an underlying problem. And as a result of that underlying problem, the emotions may be negative. But I think using the term negative emotions is kind of building on the anthropomorphism of yeah. human emotion, which horses don't experience. Yeah, good point. Um, Mandy's asked a quite a long question, um, Rosa, but it, the nut of it, uh, the, the core of it, is the fact that her horse is unpredictable. I, sometimes when she's stable, she's lovely with a soft eye and seeking interaction, nuzzling and happy. Other times she becomes very nasty, her eyes change fast and her ears go flat. Can you, what, uh, what advice could you give Mandy? Um, see if it <laughs> ask for some investigation. Um, I think you're absolutely right. It could be hormonal. If you can try and track this throughout her Easter cycle, is it a seasonal behaviour? Um, I see a lot of people who are talking about horses that become grumpier as we're getting into winter time. But think about those management changes that you're making as well. So try and track track what's happening with management, with perhaps increased or decreased amount of riding, changes to feed, changes to social composition. 
Sometimes it can be a really simple thing in terms of meeting their behavioural needs and other times it might be a lot more complex and could be pain related or due to hormonal changes. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to have to draw it to a close. There are so many good questions coming in. I'm really sorry. Lucinda has asked, Sue, it takes six years for horses to be physically mature. Why are we jumping and dressage, dressaging them? Uh, why are they jumping and dressage classes for four year old horses? Um, I'm rather opposed to them. I have judged some young horse event classes. Um, so looked at four year olds and they are amazingly different in their level of maturity. Um, they are a shop window for producers and sellers, um, which is why they're perpetuated, I think. But I personally feel that for the longevity of horses, that to be competing them at four years of age is inappropriate. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Listen, we, we could I mean, we, I, I could listen to the two of you all night and I could get we'll be sure to get questions all evening as well. But we're going to have to draw it to a close. We have covered so much. Um, Rosa, um, <laughs> now we've just had an hour and a half of outstanding information. What's one or two key points that you th think people should take home? Um, please listen to your horse. The behaviour is their way to communicate with you. So try to listen to what they're saying. And if you don't understand, try and find the answers and ask for help. It's really important that we are advocating for our horses and it's up to us to look out for them and give them the best possible lives we can. Advocating for the horse. That's a wonderful way of, of, of expressing it. Sue, what are your final thoughts? Well, I would endorse what Rosa has said, but also just say, look, see. Think about what you see and ask why. There you go. That's brilliant. I listen, I, I as I say, I could go on and listen to you guys all night. Thank you so, so much. Well, firstly, thank you to everyone for joining us for your quite brilliant questions. And my apologies for being an inept chair, but I haven't been able to get through more of them. But, you, but thank you so much for putting them. And a huge thank you to Sue and Rosa. That that was simply brilliant. And a wonderful way to get the uh, uh, World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinars for 2022 kick started. So that's brilliant. As you know, if you joined us at the beginning, uh, we've got our next webinar in two weeks time the date it might be on Wednesday the 14th of December but if a certain football match goes ahead that involves England um, except because we are based in England most but not all of our viewers do come from England uh, that we might move it but it's going to be uh, eventing grandee uh, Pippa Funnel and Elsa Waite who are going to be talking about balancing the needs of the horse with the pressure of competition. If your football team is still in the World Cup, hooray for that. Um, if it's it's not or, or never got there, then I'm sorry, but the next World Cup is never far along. Uh, so uh, best of luck with that. Sue, Rosa, thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. And I really look forward to seeing you in uh, a couple of weeks time, plus or minus two days. Have a great time and a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.